Got out of the Army, had a degree in finance, went to work for Merrill Lynch in 1969. And I got a job in New York with Merrill on their bond desk. So when I say I'm on their trading desk, that doesn't mean I was a bond trader. I mean, I was a 26-year-old veteran who was a clerk. I got coffee for the five traders who were on the bond desk. I'm saying this because I want people to understand the difference between what the bond market was like then, what it's like now, and what futures had to do with changing that whole dynamic. And it is dynamic. Oh, there were, at that time, there were 12 primary dealers. That's the inner sanctum of the government bond business. Of those dealers, there were five. Merrill Lynch, Solomon Brothers, New York Hanseatic, First Boston, and Aubrey Lanson were, that were the biggest, major participants. And how we followed the market was there were brokers, what we called brokers wires. And these were outside agents that if I'm on a bond desk for Merrill Lynch, I could trade through this. There'd be the screen showing me where the bond is being offered by all of us in the inner sanctum, offered and bid. So I could call up the broker, pick up that wire, RMJ or FBI, those were brokers, uh, offer the bond at 12, you know, and I'm Merrill Lynch. It doesn't say Merrill Lynch on the screen. It just says offered at 12. Solomon Brothers over here may see that offer at 12. Buy him. We never know who we bought from or who we sold to. Now, here I am at this desk, six traders. I'm going off to get their coffee, and God forbid that I don't know that a regular coffee means cream only. You, know, you get fired if you don't know what that order means. Those screens are this way. We have 25 government bond salesmen out in front of the desk. They are completely in the dark as to what the market is, other than to ask me or one of the traders up there, where's the long bond? I'll pay, and we would trade for an eighth, meaning four thirty-second spread. So I might say the market is three quarters at seven eighths. Good for five million up. Customers, we're not talking about Mr. Jones, we're talking Bank America, Harris Trust, all of the big banks, they don't know where the market is. They've got to call Solomon or Merrill Lynch or a Hanseatic to find out where they can buy or sell bonds. That's the way things are. It's a huge advantage for the dealer to have that kind of a locked community. Well, I really did like the trading business, my exposure back in New York, and my good friend who had been a broker with stockbroker with me at the time, Jack Cardoza, who later came to uh, Chicago to become probably the most successful spread trade or, or, or crusher oh, sure. in, uh, in Chicago. So Jack calls me up. He's already in Chicago. He's working for a little firm called Hornblower. And he says, Bill, you know they're going to open a, a Ginnie Mae futures contract. Ah, mortgages. I know the mortgage business. I sold some of the first mortgages when I was with Merrill Lynch. Oh, tell me about it tells me. And I said, can you short them? He says, of course you can short them. Now, in the cash market, it is extremely difficult to short anything. It means you have to borrow the bonds from somebody and then sell them and replace them at some... That, that's not any... Not just anybody can get to do that. Primary dealers can buy and sell and short bonds, but other not. So it's a... Bonds are a very inefficient market because they can't be sold, sold short. So I come back to do my thing for Hornblower being the interest rates analyst. They gave me a membership and I would be the analyst on interest rates before the market. When I was on the floor, I talked, and now I'm with Payne Weber, and I talked Payne Weber into allowing me in Chicago to have, remember that broker wire scenario that is in New York? I want to have access to the broker's market, and I'm going to trade cap bonds versus futures. And Miles Slater, who ran the department at that time, let me do it. Nobody. In Chicago, there were two. Continental Bank and First Chicken, uh, First Chicago, had uh, uh, the only other broker's wires in Chicago. And then me, this little independent outfit working for, I mean, Payne Weber, when Miles left, the new bond guy that came in, was very upset that he had a free agent out there in Chicago that's trading bonds when it should be in his department. Anyway, 
So I'm trading cash against futures. We're doing well. I bring in as a partner, a man named Bob Showmaker, who was the head Ginny Mae trader for Payne Weber. And he wanted to do something different. He liked this idea. So I gave him the bonds and I started trading treasury bills against bill futures and money market instruments. Once we started bond futures, Ginny Mae futures, and then bond futures, the spread, remember I said the spread was 430 seconds in New York. We start this contract in Chicago and all us knuckleheads, meaning mostly locals in the pit, you know, the, that C is the, you know, I'm telling, speaking to the choir here, but the top step are brokers, the largest locals are closest to the brokers, and then you got the back spreads and smaller traders, and the, they're all making this market 132nd wide. So what am I doing as a cash to futures trader? I'm making a market in the bonds. That's the least liquid, the least liquid. It's 430 seconds wide. The futures is just 130 second wide. If I get lifted for my offer in bonds, I, buy, I you know, I didn't sell the futures or vice versa. So it was, as time went on, that futures market, in the beginning, New York dealers had nothing to do with Chicago. And the reason I can say that is, remember, I'm from that world originally. And my clients were, I had a George Grimm at Merrill Lynch as a client. I had Rexel Burnham and I had Cantor Fitzgerald. So I knew, and they only played with it. They never really traded cash to futures. So what happened in time is all this volume is being driven to Chicago because of the narrowness of the spread. New York had to drop and narrow their spreads to compete. So what was a 30-second market here drove New York to go from an eighth down to a 30-second. Can you imagine how humiliating that must be to New Yorkers? <laughs> okay, to me, that is a huge step in those 21 years that Futures Open Outcry existed on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade. The other big development actually happened to the commodities market, and that was these knuckleheads like me who are in the bond pit. Well, when we first got there, you had to, here's an order. I want, you know, Tom's my broker. I want him to buy 100 at a price. I hand it to a trader, I mean a runner who runs it into Tom. Tom reads it. He represents the market. When it's filled, what does he do? He throws that piece of paper on the floor. Eventually my runner comes and gets it, comes back and says, you're filled. And I tell the customer, or in this case it's myself. So in the bond pit, we didn't like that. <laughs> digital order. Electronic trading? No. The first digital order was sell one at the market. That's a digital order. So that became, we were flashing five, 10, 1, 10, 100, all hand signals into the pit. And when the pit got the, you know, they started communicating with each other with hand signals. Who bought them? Well, Kidder Peabody or Payne Weber, Shearson. We all had hand signals from it. Hank, yes. Right, and, and Terry Cullerton was at his, <laughs> Terry Cullerton, Baldy, had, they had their own, their own symbols. So, that incredibly tightened and shortened the time span on how futures operated. So the two things, the two things helped each other out, but the biggest help was collapsing that treasury bond spread to a market that was much more efficient. It saved the tax, I, I would like to say, to America. That saved taxpayers in terms of interest by narrowing that spread billions of dollars over the course of the contract. I mean, tens of billions of dollars. First day on the floor. I've just moved here from California. I've been a money manager for a firm that ran money for SNLs. I've been hired as the interest rate analyst, and I've got this financial instruments badge, brand new badge, you know. Go into the South Room, the South Annex there, where they traded Jenny Mays. Bonds weren't there yet. All right, I have a tan suit on because I'm an executive. I'm a vice president with this company. <laughs> go onto the floor, and I'm walking around with uh, the floor manager who's kind of showing me where everything is. And while I'm doing that, someone has come up to me from behind and with a felt tip pen has written on my tan suit, asshole. <laughs> so I go home, that's my first introduction to the commodity market. Two days later, I'm back and I'm, you know, kind of got my jacket on now. I don't look like the asshole. I look like all the rest of the people there. Pay one for 12 or pay one for pay one for one pay two for one sell i'm practicing how to do this so 2 days later gus nesvik who has become the head floor trader for payne weber 
He worked mostly in the grain room. He had a client that he would buy stuff for and sell. And he comes over to the new guy, goes into Jenny May Pitt, sees Bill Dudley, we meet, he says, I want you to do something for me. Sure. Go in there and sell 50 Jenny Mays, current contract. I've, I haven't even executed an order. And now, what am I going to do? Say, I don't know how. <laughs> so I go in and I'm standing right next to Tom. And, What's here? Well, what do you got? <laughs> they don't even answer me with the market. You know, what do you got? Give it to Tom. <laughs> I said, what do you got? And they're saying, hey, a couple of hands are holding up 12 bid. One guy's offering it at 13. And uh, you know, I thought I'd act professional. So I hold two hands out and I say, I go, I go like this. I want to make sure my hands are in the shot. I say, sell it at 13. And Tom O'Halloran walks behind me and takes my hands and goes like that. <laughs> <laughs> so now my embarrassment is fourfold. Okay, sell it at 13. And I won't say who his name is. He says, how many you got? I said, I'm looking to sell 15. He says, sell it at 12. <laughs> sell. I'm, so Gus Nesbick now walks into the pit and says, never mind. <laughs>
long bonds and short Ginnie Mae futures. That this spreads a little bit out of line. And here's something we can ride, Bill. We don't have to just scalp this. We'll just leave this on and we'll keep adding to it as the trade goes our way. It did not go our way from day one. And this was the demise of the Ginnie Mae contract. I won't get into why Ginnie Mae futures didn't work, but it actually, the Ginnie Mae contract was really a potentially a perpetual contract. It always, the futures always had to be refurbished with new Ginnie Mays as they expired. So we were really short or long a 30 year, 25 year treasury bond and short a potential perpetual bond. So the spreads were out of line here, they got out of line here, they got out of line here. I realized, I said to my partner, I said, you know, we don't really know why we're losing money. And that's what's wrong about what we're doing. We can't figure out why it's here. We know it's wrong, but it's not getting better. It's getting worse. I'm going to, I'm going to get us out. And so I go to, yeah, Ray wouldn't mind. I go to Ray Conman. Hey, Ray, I know you're the same way I am in this trade. I am going to get out. Do you want to take it? Do you want to buy my position? You know, we, I know we have to do this in the pit, but I'm willing to sell this cheaper than what it's quoted up there. Ray says, I'm not sure you're doing the right thing, but I don't want to take any more. So fortunately, my partner, Bob Showmaker, goes into the cash market and finds a buyer outside who's a Ginnie Mae cash specialist. He takes it. We get, we're out of the position. We've lost a half million dollars in that trade. Remember I told you New York didn't want me being in that business that they view as theirs. So they came back and said, Bill, I know you're making money at this business, but this uh, virtually this gives up the opportunity to fire you. And we will fire you if you stay in Chicago. But if you move to New York, we'd like you to do this business for us in New York City. So I don't want to do that. I love being in Chicago. I like what I do. There are other markets for me to expand my experimentation with. Uh, Bob Heidi, who we talked about, I talked to Bob Heine about what I did. And uh, then I go see Gib Clark, who's the head treasury bond trader in New York. He knows me. We talk about it. Why aren't you coming to New York? I love it in Chicago. Why don't you be my customer, Gib? <laughs> you know, might as well pitch him on something. And I talk to him about Bob Heine, and he says, well, send Bob to see me, and I know it's going to work out. So Bob leaves. He takes what was my job, and from there, Bob becomes the best short-term arbitrage that's ever been in the business. So that was cool. That was my best decision because that spread would have gone to a two and a half million dollar loss. Getting out as bad a trade as it was, probably the best trade I ever made because of where it was eventually going to go to. We're out, I think it's a 20 lot. And I think it's a sell versus sell, but I can't really remember. I go over there. Um, the market where it closed is already like, you know, a 30, 40, 50 thousand dollar loser. And there's no call because the market hasn't opened yet. Well, if we can't come to an agreement, um, you know, they're going to they're going to we're going to make a split 50 50. Um, by the same token, if he takes the trade, which I thought it was his fault, um, he can't begin to cover this. And I don't think the firm that I, so I tell the broker who are listening to this, unfortunately, I had a number of Merck members there. I said, I tell you what. I'll split the error with you 50-50, to which he was dumbfounded that I would be so stupid <laughs> as to offer to split it 50-50. But I saw no win for us if we went to court and the possible win if we split 50-50. Uh, in retrospect, if that hadn't worked out, the firm may well have fired me for making that decision. But we did. We did the trade. Sure enough, bonds were down, stocks screamed. And there was an error that morning on, I think it was Shearson or Dean Witter, they had an order to buy, say, 200. He misread it as 2,000. So market opens, wham! I mean, it's through the roof. And that out trade wound up being a multi-million dollar winner that we split down the middle. So that was my scariest, by far my scariest, those, those 35 minutes before the market opened and knowing that if this isn't the right call, Bill, there, and it goes down from here and you have agreed to split this error and you really had a good case for why it not your error, you're probably, you're canned. When I was in trouble in that Ginny May spread, um, who did I decide to talk to? I decided to talk to a guy who I'd known for 20 years, 
who I'd done spreads with and against, who I'd fought with about, you know, why he got the edge that I didn't, that my broker didn't get, and da 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 da, who also was instrument, instrumental in not, he could have hurt that. When I had to liquidate, what's his name's position? Hey, Ray was the biggest spread trader in there, and Jenny Mays, and all of that had impact on his markets. Tom Clements was my broker in there, and uh, uh, Ray conducted himself so honorably during that period of time. He didn't ever ask me, never once, everybody else asked me, he never once asked me, how many more do you have to go? You know, like, how could I possibly in conscience tell you how many more I've got? I've got another 17,000 to go and it's only noon. You know, how could I possibly say that? Uh, so he could have, when my Jenny May trade, when I said, here's what I am and I'm getting out, he could have done something to advantage his position on that. He didn't. He just, I can't, I don't want to do it, Bill. I think you might be doing the right thing, but I'm in for, I'm in for more than this. So years later, he, when I saw him at a board of trade function, I was out of the business. He said, we said hello, we laughed and everything. He says, well, and he, a whole bunch of people are, he says, well, I know this guy's best trade. <laughs> and he's the Ginny May trade. I was blessed to come across some really talented young people who I gave an opportunity to, an opportunity to, just as Gary did. We gave them money to put at risk in the name of the firm. We trusted them. We were paid off. We were paid off by their success because we made money on their success. We worked for that firm. And we have the pleasure of knowing that out there, there's a cadre of extremely successful 50-year-olds who got their start with us. That's my best trait.